as is our custom at the Kushwa Center, we use the break to announce our next seminar in American religion. So scheduled for, um, for April 15th, 2023, we have Catherine Jin Loom of Stanford University's book, Heathen Religion and Race in American History with commentators Emily Clark from Gonzaga and my colleague in the Department of American Studies, Corey Garibaldi. So mark your calendars now. We're very excited about that. Um, it's on the flyer, April 15th, 2023. And then um, the big publication of this uh, falls, um, this flyer should be on, on the desk, so I think we need a couple more. Um, this edition of the American Catholic Studies newsletter, which um, I just want to give uh, just a, a big shout out to the other distinguished Philip in the audience, Philip Byers, um, who is um, as, as serving as, as the editor of this, and of course with Shane um, Ulbrich, who has been working on the newsletter for a while. This, these things take about seven months to put together, and this is a particularly exciting issue. So um, don't read it now. We have uh, a discussion to do, we have to, so resist the temptation, but please um, take it with you and enjoy. All right, um, well, we are, uh, as I said, ready to open our discussion. Many questions already on the table, and surely many others will arise. We are gonna ask that you speak into the microphone for purposes of the recording, and Philip is, is ready uh, with the microphone to come to you. So the floor is open. I invite questions that you can direct to um, our entire panel, or to the author, or to one of the commentators. Um, Really, uh, yes, Brad Gregory, please. Thanks very much, uh, Philip. We had a chance to chat a bit last night too. Re very much enjoyed the book. I think the, the service that you do for historians more broadly is extremely important in terms of drawing attention to the importance of climate and whatever its particular relationship might be uh, to um, religion in the past, present, and prospects for the future. Two questions, the first concerns the relationship between the heterogeneity of the character of the relationship between climate and religious phenomena across the four principal episodes that you, you discuss in relationship to the key verb in your subtitle, and that is drive. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was thinking about it, because other parts of the book suggest in some instances a stronger relationship, leaning more towards causality, could not have happened without um, the, these counterfactuals are hazardous, however. And so when I was thinking about this in terms of um, how, to, how to characterize it, I'd just like to hear you sort of think about it a bit more. Mm -hmm. We could arrange them on a spectrum, right? And you're shying away at the strongest claim would be determine, right? It, that's not the case. Cause would be slightly less emphatic, but still, I think, uh, to the strong side of drive. Then you have drive, which I think is pretty strong. Pretty strong. For example, you could have chosen shape, which strikes me as influential, but not as strong as drive. You might have had effect, which now we're getting weaker, and then choices that no publisher ever would have gone for. Sometimes influence, <laughs> or seem sometimes to be relevant to. Okay, so that's the, that's the spectrum. So the first question is just why you think a little bit about that and what, whether your choice was drive, whether you think another word might be you know, also equally appropriate, or because it strikes me that the, 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 the difficulty and the challenge is you've got a range of different kinds of important issues, all of which it's clearly significant in some way, but um, whether, whether we can or should speak in, in one uh, idiom about that particular relationship. My second question is about um, your focus on climate in relationship to the, we could call it the headline issue of the Anthropocene, and this comes out in, in chapter two, but Anthropocene history and the Anthropocene is not a fun, kind of defining conceptual category in this book. It's about climate, even though in chapter two, it's exactly that distinction that you're, you're really drawing out. The four episodes that you, you concentrate on, right, the, third, the early 14th century, 1560s, 70s, late 17th century, and the, the four years, 1739 to 42, I like the, the kind of tentative model that you're building. What we can see is that more advanced societies with greater institutional resources and so forth seem to be able to deal with these better than the, the earlier ones with, with lesser resources. And the 1670s and 80s compared to the 40s, it seems to me, is the, is the best control and, 
and close comparison that you have there. All of those right, examples, as you know, are all dealing with attempts to manage non-anthropogenic climate change, mm -hmm. dealing with sunspots, dealing with right, El Nino cycles, volcanic activity, and so forth. By contrast, what we're in now is not non-anthropogenic driven planetary changes. It's anthropogenically driven. And the other big difference with respect to your model is, of course, that it is precisely the latter-day uh, iterations of those weird societies, the most advanced ones, the ones with the most striving for wealth, based on uh, an economic model of ever greater growth, more consumption, let's extend to the rest of the world um, uh, the, the kinds of benefits and possibilities that, that they've been excluded from and so forth. That is the problem. That is what has driven the particular kind of climate change that headlines the Anthropocene that we're in now. And so I wonder if you could say something about you, whether you think that particular distinction ought to be emphasized more and um, what, what that augurs for um, your, your kind of speculations and thoughts. I mean, I thought really impressive and, and um, you know, salutary thoughts about what the, the coming decades and century might bring. Okay, yeah, uh, two very important uh, questions. Um, I chose uh, those four uh, periods because they did offer a range. Um, I, I mean, there are probably uh, four or five others I could have chosen very, uh, very easily. Uh, you know, I didn't take the, uh, the sixth century one because there's already a terrific uh, uh, book uh, uh, on that. Um, for the, um, the, the range of uh, choices, the range of uh, eras, you, you actually mentioned one of the, uh, the key things. Partly what I'm studying is the evolution of society, uh, societies and their capacity to cope with uh, these things in terms of the, uh, the scale of the uh, state of police mechanisms, of technology, of transportation. So for example, in uh, 1320, when there's a basically social meltdown uh, in France, and you have these armies of you know tens of thousands of peasants who are out to kill Jews or aristocrats, and they don't really care which, um, the monarchy basically doesn't have many ways to respond to them, uh, except saying, why not go off on crusade somewhere, you know, just head south. Um, if people start in uh, the 18th century trying to launch a pogrom against uh, uh, Jews, the government has very good police forces, and they're going to start hanging rioters in large, uh, large numbers. Um, so uh, states become much more significant after the, um, the 17th century. And the other thing that happens between, say, 1320 and 1740 uh, is, is world trade, uh, uh, trade and transportation. If you have a bunch of dissidents in 1320, you have to figure out some way of coping with them in your own territory. Uh, in 1680 or 1740, you can drop them in Africa or the Americas or the, the Pacific. You know, glo globalization really does uh, completely reshape or at least exercise a mild influence upon uh, what, what governments can, uh, uh, can do with these uh, people. So I, I was interested in the the range of um, possible uh, influences from, as you say, determine, cause, drive, exercise influence, and say that that does uh, change over, uh, over time. And that then becomes very important for looking at the different responses of global north and global south nations. Countries like the Netherlands, for example, are there because people figured out how to uh, channel climate factors uh, for their own defense. I'm not saying they, they will hold out forever, but they will hold out longer than many people. Countries like something we were talking about earlier, uh, Burkina Faso, <coughs> are largely uh, uh, at the mercy of those kind of tendencies. And uh, please, please excuse me drawing this uh, historical analogy, like medieval European um, uh, societies. Um, the, the anthropogenic one is, um, of course, it's very important. You know, we're in the um, Anthropocene. There's a lot of debate about whether some of those early changes, like the ones in the, uh, the late 16th, early 17th century, were affected at all by uh, anthropogenic factors. 
you know, you have a massive collapse of um, the number of Native American people. Uh, they're not building fires. Uh, they're having less of an impact on the environment. That changes the uh, climate slate somewhat uh, worldwide. If you are in West Africa and the local lake is drying up and you don't exactly know how you're going to live, it doesn't really matter from their point of view and the effects whether it is anthropogenic or not, uh, whether it's a supervolcano in Indonesia or whether it's a series of very bad uh, decisions in the United States and, um, and Europe. So from that point of view, um, it doesn't matter in what the likely causation, uh, the likely consequences are. You know whether it will be reflected in witchcraft accusations or scapegoating, uh, whatever. In terms of policy, it matters enormously. And in fact, uh, yeah, one thing I do mention is some of the incidents where you get very dramatic climate events um, that don't have religious consequences or, uh, or indeed don't affect much of the world. And the 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 um, the dog that did not bark in the night is Mount Pinatubo in 1991, which was a very big deal if you're a surfer in California, um, but, but really uh, uh, was on the scale with some of the really huge volcanic eruptions of earlier centuries, had next to no impact on the global north. So um, as I say, uh, the, the Anthropocene issue is crucial for policy but in terms of project, projecting consequences and possible religious implications, it's not so important for, uh, for, for my purposes. Okay, so I hope that answers. Yes, Rachel. Hi, thank you for this great discussion. And Celia, your ending comment really intrigued me and, right. and I'm curious to know more. And Jana, we're just talking about this. So we're wondering if you have any contenders or models of the kind of history that you're recommending? Like where can we point to the, the care? Um, and I have one sort of cognate model that I'm thinking of that, that came to mind of David Troyer's uh, recent book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, um, which I just put a quote from in a recent grant application um, I submitted. But he says, I cannot shake the belief that the ways in which we tell the story of our reality shapes that reality. The manner of telling makes the world. And I worry that if we tell the story of the past as a tragedy, we consign ourselves to a tragic future. Um, and he's writing in the context of writing Native history. And so his, we, and he refers to the, um, D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee as having killed the victims of, of Wounded Knee twice, the second time at the end of a pen. And so his sweeping history is looking at Native history and survival and how people, you know, how people lived uh, in the face of these, these tragic consequences. And I wonder what that might look like in, in the climate context. Well, I mean, I, I was provoking historians to take up the mantle, I guess, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, scientists like um, Pinker, his Angels of Our Better Nature are a story of disaster, and they become extremely popular um, and influential, but they're not necessarily the only history, deep history you could tell. So, so I suppose I'm just, just trying to, uh, and uh, there are also we have quite a lot of contact with indigenous populations as well through the work I do at our institute. Um, and Philip is quite right that they may not necessarily um, work out what the reasons are for some of the disasters that happen to them, but sometimes they seem to be, they, they do recognize certain incidences where there is deliberate oppression and that kind of thing. So, so I think there's becoming, they're beginning to become more aware of some of those bigger global issues. Um, and you know, it's listening to those marginalized stories that I'm interested in, I guess, rather than necessarily the, the ones that have become dominant, because I think the temptation to um, listen to negative history is sort of built into our psychology, so it's rather like, you know, a focus on sin and death and a sort of punishment. We kind of somehow drawn to that, like we're drawn to li listening to horror movies or <laughs> violence. Uh, I'm not drawn to them, but some people are. So, so you see what I mean? So it's, it just starts to shape, you know, the way you think. And I think that's, I think it's really important to be aware of some of those, um, uh, what you might call background temptations, if you will, broader background temptations, 
to listen to the history that we want to hear. And in the context of the Anthropocene, which uh, you know, we hopefully heard about, I think it's also even more likely that we're going to be listening to those kind of stories more frequently, because it is a, it is a, um, a, a story of an end that may not have a, have a good ending. You know, there isn't any, the possibility of hope being completely suppressed is very strong. So what do you do in the context where there isn't any possibility of recovery? Um, some, uh, it was one of the um, postdoctoral fellow who's now got a position at Edinburgh University called Bethany Solaridaire, who's working with me. She's convinced that our theology needs to just face up to the fact that we're going to go extinct, and, and this is the kind of theology we need to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite ready to say that yet, and I don't know why. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying that, you know, we need to sort of be aware of the narratives that we create, because in a sense we still have the freedom to make decisions. Um, the, you know, I don't think, I think there are inevitable ways in which we come to an end. And someone like John Burr, for example, even if we think about this as in terms of, of, of death, if you like, the death of the, of the human species, it's the way we approach the end that can, sometimes tells us more about what it means to be human. So how are we going to approach that end? Are we going to approach it... You know, through a you know a Christian lens, or are we going to revert to some of these other kind of forms of thinking, which uh, lead to scapegoating, violence, persecution? I would like to think that we're not going to be going down that route. Um, but as I said, I'm just wanting historians to say, well, maybe there are other narratives too that we need to hear, not to deny what's been suggested, but to say that the, that, that there has to be a balance, rather like you know. Calvinists focused on the sin of humanity. There is also another possibility that maybe our natures, as fine as thought, were rather mic more mixed than that. May I just add a footnote to that? You talk about listening to uh, indigenous stories. Um, what, one of the biggest uh, things we can learn in that is being very sensitive to understanding what, what seem to us as mythologies uh, as actually very useful and sensible ways of understanding uh, uh, things. I mean, you, you can, there's a literature, for instance, on understanding tsunamis in the early modern Pacific as they strike uh, native peoples in the Pacific Northwest and in Japan. Mm -hmm. And they do it through a series of metaphors and mythical structures. Um, <laughs> catastrophes of different kinds in different uh, societies uh, pre-modern societies also generate an incredible art as well as the uh, mythology. So that listening process is, is a very interesting one, very important one. Please. And one additional note uh, in response to what you asked, Rachel, I, I, re I recently reviewed a new book for the journal of the, s for the study of religion, nature, and culture called uh, Weather, Religion, and Climate Change by Sigurd Bergman. And he's um, a theologian, really, by training. Uh, but this is one thing he focuses on, um, what uh, hopeful resources can we identify in uh, religious traditions, but particularly Christianity, as a way forward in the present crisis. And his, the picture he paints is, is certainly more impressionistic than systematic, and yet it, it is an interesting book, and I think it represents um, the early phase of work in that direction, and, and Celia is involved with him, I know, in some mm -hmm. projects, and so I think there's a lot going on on the other side of the Atlantic um, right now. Thank you. Tom Tweed. Philip is, keeps looking at me like I'm supposed to say something now, so I, I will. But uh, I really enjoyed the book and the panel. Uh, thanks so much. I really enjoyed Rachel's question about how you do the history thing. Uh, I guess I had uh, two things. One, the second, a question for Peter and Philip. And um, the first, a, a, a kind of a thinking out loud of how do, how do we write histories that both document despair and hope? I give some source of that and give the full complexity. I, I mean, as some of in the room uh, know, I've been working on a book forever uh, that tries to do this. But uh, my strategy was to sort of think about the conditions for individual, communal, and environmental flourishing 
then ask, um, uh, when, when were there crisis, sustainability crises, historically? And how did religion ease and exac exacerbate those crises? So at each moment, you find religious resources being used to make things worse and to make things better. Um, that some, at some historical moments, you don't have as much hope as, <laughs> as you have despair, but that's sort of been uh, my way of thinking about it. Uh, secondly, I'm, and this is really for, for Philip and Peter, as I'm thinking about the kinds of examples you used and things, there's another typology of religion. I'm just wondering out loud how we map religious um, types onto climate and weather and other things. And, and what came to mind was, um, when I think about the, the revivals of the, of the mid 18th century, I, I've used, uh, I've borrowed a, a phrase from Tang Dynasty Chan studies, where they talk about gradual religion and sudden religion. Mm. Um, and there's an internal debate among Chan Buddhists. Um, should you take the sudden path, where there's a flash of insight, or should you do, no, no, should, should it be a gradual process? I wonder, how weather climate is related to differences between sudden religion and gradual religion. Uh -huh. So uh, Cutler, I would say, is kind of a gradual religion guy. I mean, I, I don't want to characterize him too much. Uh, whereas others are, I don't, I don't want to put Edwards anywhere, but others are not. And I wonder if there's some way, are, are, is the hypothesis that forms of sudden forms of religion where instantaneous paths to spiritual goals are more inclined uh, to, to dom predominate at moments of crisis. And um, gradual, slow ones that think about cultivation, use other kinds of metaphors, uh, maybe don't. I, I wonder if there's a, a third Chan school called the Punctuated Equilibrium School. Which is, uh, you know, um, th th that, that actually uh, works, um, works very well, because if I look, for instance, at the uh, 1670s, uh, one of the big movements um, is the emergence of, um, of pietism, well, with ideas of uh, heart religion and um, uh, conversion, and indeed, let me see, what is that phrase, oh yes, born again. Um, and th there is then, through those forced migrations, uh, a merger of that with um, British-derived methods of promulgating religion through field, meet, uh, field preaching. You put A and B together, you get camp meetings. Uh, but I like that uh, sudden, and, uh, uh, sudden and gradual um, idea. By the way, you, you, you mentioned um, uh, China. Uh, there's also a very big literature on how some of the kind of climate uh, disasters provoke responses in China, which look very, very much like those in, um, in Europe in terms of witchcraft panics and, uh, and so on. So, Well, I too like that um, way of conceptualizing it, sudden, sudden versus gradual. Uh, and I, I mean, the thought off the top of my head is that though I don't use those exact terms, in, in many ways that reflects a lot of what I do in, in the Christianity survey course I teach just about every year, where um, running through the whole tradition, all the centuries, is um, a tension between gradual development, institutionalization, uh, codification, and so on, um, which favors uh, a process involving deliberation and so on, versus the sudden theme, which is there also from the beginning and is deeply written into scripture as well. I, I, I mean, the sudden theme, maybe we can call it the apocalyptic theme, is arguably the message of Jesus from the beginning, um, that this generation will not pass away before all these things come to pass. And so, um, I, I think Christianity has been balancing those from the beginning, and it, I mean, it, it accounts, I think, for uh, some of the vitality of the tradition. Uh, but I, I think it, it, you, you've given me a, a, 
a good way to think about that further. And uh, one of the aspects of sudden religion, so to speak, uh, is that it often presents its rhetoric as being um, back to the authentic earliest phases. Um, and, so, and that's most obvious, for example, in Islam, uh, where uh, uh, reformists are uh, Salafi, which means let's get back to the, uh, back to the beginning. Philip, I, I want to pick up on this, and in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, I want to pick up on something uh, you said in your conclusion about your interest in this was really rooted in your reading of speculative fiction um, many, many decades ago began. And I, I read a lot of um, disaster fiction um, as well, and I realized um, that so many of my favorites have a redemptive quality to it. So Station Eleven, I mean, it's societal collapse, but there's also redemption. Whereas something like Jesse Greenglass's High House is completely, I don't know if you read that one, but that's completely depressing. And so I think novels, and, and, and hearing about, uh, hearing that quote, Rachel, it's just the novels um, can imagine a more hopeful future as well. So I wanted to ask you what novels you're reading now or what you find, uh, are you still reading speculative fiction on this and how does that influence your work? Um, not so much uh, about um, about this aspect. Um, boy, uh, I, I, I touched on that in the book, and I particularly talked about uh, uh, J. G. Ballard. I, I feel a great sense of satisfaction uh, when I, when I cite Ballard because um, back when I was um, in um, in school, uh, I used to get copies of my Ballard books. Uh, confiscated and uh, being sent home for uh, for having them, and now of course he is very very canonical, so, so that's uh, 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 that's good to know. Um, wh one thing I have got very intrigued by in recent years is a very different kind of speculative fiction, which is a kind of horror literature, which is called folk horror, which is all about uh, humanity's very contorted relationship with uh, nature and the uh, understanding it as fear and the sense of you know going out into the woods being something that is scary because it's not something that people advanced people like us uh, do and it's often a way of understanding the please hear the quotes around this word the primitive um, and uh, so folk horror in terms of film and literature has become quite widespread in uh, Latin American fiction, uh, especially, um, as a way of bringing back the ghosts of lost indigenous societies through the medium of horror. So does it get precisely to this issue of climate? No, but in terms of the relationship to the, uh, the natural environment, I think there are some very interesting uh, explorations of that in that uh, uh, in that horror medium, uh, uh, Celia and I have an irreconcilable difference over this issue, but that, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's fine. Questions? Janine. So got <laughs> this is not a very well-formed question, but I have been thinking about that. So on one hand, you can read this book and say, there are no villains. It's a global history without villains because the villains are, you know, the magma under the ground, right? It, it's just world, these, these global changes happen. On the other mm. hand, there's, there's this element that you just mentioned, that the empire and the sort of construction of the global north is, is a problem, right? And that, that's the other sort of way that we tell global history is, you know, the construction of the weird nations, the, the story of, of exploitation of the global south. So I'm, I'm curious, as you tell the story of world religions or global Christianity, what is the place of empire and what is the place of just sort of natural phenomena as the, causa as the causation, as, the, as our first question asked, is sort of like, does climate change drive religious upheaval or, or, is, or are there other sort of major drivers that are just as important? Well, that, is not, that is not. That is a very good question. Yeah. That is not a. <laughs> it, it, uh, so I'll give you a not a well-formed answer. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm, the, the book I'm writing uh, presently is about empires uh, as a force driving or shaping, as you wish, uh, world uh, world religions. 
And the um, model I particularly use is that of um, ghosts. There's a famous uh, quote from uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, about when he looked at the uh, papacy, uh, he could see nothing other than the ghost of the uh, Roman Empire. And in fact, it's one little quote, but he extends that through a long discussion, which is absolutely brilliant and often funny. Um, but if you look at uh, world religions more widely, that works so well. If you look at Buddhism, for example, uh, you, you, you see that um, as the ghost phantom of uh, successive empires in India and, uh, and Central uh, Asia, uh, the language of uh, Pali, of the uh, Pali canon, uh, Buddhists will tell you faithfully that was the imperial language of the Magadi empires. It probably wasn't, but they believe it, and uh, th that is what's uh, uh, really important. If I was to map the world's largest Catholic populations uh, today, uh, oh boy, you'd see the ghost of empires, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the French and the, uh, uh, and the Belgian, often we're dealing with unintended uh, consequences. Uh, but I, I would argue that uh, empires are a very important uh, shaping um, factor here. And so many of the, those empires have risen or fallen in connection with some of these climate episodes and climate catastrophes. And so I'm trying to integrate uh, uh, integrate those two. Um, what, one of the hot issues in American history in the last few years is um, is and was the United States an empire in anything like the sense of those other empires? And I, I strongly tend to the uh, argument of, um, of yes, indeed. If the uh, America of uh, uh, Jackson and Polk uh, was not an aggressive expanding empire, then the word empire has no meaning. Um, and so I think the, um, empire is a very hot topic in literature around, historical literature around the world. Uh, there's a great deal written. There are a great many insights. And what I'm trying to do right now is trying to apply those to the study of the impact on religion. Thank you, Phil, for this great book. I learned so much through it. My question is building off a little bit of what uh, Brad asked and what Janine asked also. So on page 20, um, you say, it is not easy to locate a direct climate or economic explanation for the outbreak of the original Reformation movement. And then a line or two later, in other cases, some eras of truly extreme climate stress produced little in the way of enduring religious consequences. So I'm just wondering is how you as a historian thought through maybe the counterexamples or the evidence that maybe didn't build for the thesis yeah. the way that the rest of it does. Yeah, the, uh, the dogs that uh, did not bark in the night. Um, the 15th century one is, um, is classic. The mid 15th century, you tick all the boxes. Um, you know, colossal uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, some of the coldest uh, weather, um, uh, uh, and you get some impact. So for instance, you get an enormous impact in terms of concepts of witchcraft and driving witch panics and so on, but nothing like you would get a um, 100 years uh, later. Um, I do not have a systematic explanation there. I can point to you to every reason why there should have been uh, the, uh, that impact, and for whatever reason, um, the, uh, there is not. One of the things, I think, is that um, other factors come into play. Uh, and I think, for example, that in the mid-15th century, Europeans have got many, many other things on their uh, mind, particularly in terms of other uh, religious confrontations, confrontation with, uh, uh, with Islam, uh, especially. Um, and the thought of generating these movements on any large scale d does, not, uh, uh, does not affect. I can see something, I can cite something. Not, you know, there should have been a reformation in 1460. There isn't, <laughs> damn it. Um, and uh, so I, um, I cite that, but I, I cannot give a, um, a, a, any sort of complete um, uh, explanation. But I, I think it's useful to cite things like that to suggest it is not a simple, um, simple one, uh, uh, one for one. Um, and if I, I, I say, why isn't there a reformation in um, 1460 as opposed to uh, the 1520s? Well, the obvious thing 
is that you don't have anything like the technological support <clears throat> in terms of media and printing. Uh, it's a different technological um, environment. And um, I come back to some of the very interesting comments Celia made about evolutionary theory and how um, uh, living and moving beings affect the uh, environments in which they evolve and develop. Well, I had a question about, a, I, I guess, a dog that doesn't bark in the book, or doesn't appear in the book, but something that I think of, a catastrophe that, of course, uh, has had a, a, a great impact on American Catholicism and Irish Catholicism before that. You mentioned the Irish famine of the 1740s, but not um, the Great Famine of 1845 to 1950 that revolutionized, according to Emmett Larkin, still the devotional revolution had a dramatic impact on. So does that not fit your, your overall paradigm? Was that something that would have fit in here? Or, and yeah, if not, um, why not? I, um, I don't believe it does. I believe that arose from, uh, from other factors. Uh, if there's a climate dimension, it, uh, it does mm -hmm. not emerge um, at, all, um, at all strongly. Um, but it was a catastrophe that certainly shaped faith, so, uh, <laughs> but not a, not a climate ben, one. Um, yeah. I, you know, I can point to other, um, other examples yeah. um, uh, like that. But what I'm trying to do is to avoid the temptation to say, uh, OK, there's an article here that says there's a climate element. I better mm -hmm. list this with all my other you know, uh, ma major uh, eras. What I'm trying to do here is to look at the, the really unquestionably catastrophic uh, eras where you have so much literature substantiating and demonstrating this in different mm -hmm. parts of the world. And the potato farm do does not work in the... Doesn't um, fit the climate. In, in anything like the same degree or the same uh, way. That's not... Under, uh, uh, undermining it as a... Um, Certainly as not. A no, not at Notre Dame. Dame. You wouldn't yeah. undermine the effects of the Irish potato famine. Of course Certainly not. not. <laughs> Thank you for that. Father Bill. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> I'm reminded a bit of the old quip that uh, the great lesson of history is that things never turn out quite the way you expect. And the sort of predictive capacity of studying these various episodes is, is rather limited because we simply don't know what's going to happen next. I, I think of Putin's invasion of Ukraine mm -hmm. and how that episode, which is uh, political, diplomatic, uh, military, is having implications on how people deal with climate change issues at present, particularly in, uh, in Europe. But uh, my, that, that was just an ancillary observation. Uh, my question is more about, uh, gets back to what Professor Thewson said, uh, this question of what is going to be the implication for young people and their religious practice in the West going forward. And I, I want to raise the possibility that sometimes uh, raised in a sort of critical way that concern about climate has become almost a religion in and of itself for some young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in a secularized world, they're searching around for something to believe in. Uh, folks of my age would remember that a lot of folks thought uh, sort of Marxist ideology in the 60s was a sort of replacement for religion and uh, climate seems to have an enormous appeal for young people now and uh, a code of beliefs and so on that you have to subscribe to. Uh, I'd just be interested for any of the panel if you have any thoughts or observations about that. I'm sure you have something to say in this, I'll just tackle this uh, quickly if I may. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, it, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, English uh, movement, uh, which is a radical uh, climate activism movement, which is called Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and the rhetoric associated with that is uh, so, and I, I use the word um, very confidently, apocalyptic. Uh, but, you know, the very, the very title uh, says what it is about, and it uh, carries out these really dramatic um, uh, moves to uh, block roads and block bridges and block traffic. How do you justify this? 
because to, uh, to, to quote the great, uh, the great prophet Barry Maguire, we're on the eve of destruction. Um, so, uh, and th there's an extremely strong uh, uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, rhetoric um, uh, running through uh, all, all that. Um, Peter uh, uh, you cited, and I think we're talking about the same uh, study here, the, the recent Pew Research finding, uh, which was trying to project um, American religious loyalties in the year 2070. And uh, if you read that carefully, it was talking about a really sharp uh, decline in, um, in religious practice generally, but very specifically in, um, in Christianity. And by far the largest uh, beneficiary of this would be the group that is called the, uh, the nuns. Uh, again, a word I have to use carefully and explain well at Notre Dame. Um, but, but that the, uh, uh, the nuns could be uh, close to uh, um, approaching an overall majority of the population by that, uh, by that date. It could be talking 47, 48%. Uh, the interesting issue that then... reminds you that things rarely turn out quite the way people... <laughs> I, uh, I absolutely um, I, I, I agree with that, and that might be a pessimistic estimate for the, uh, for the nuns. I wrote an article about that the other day, and I was saying, uh, uh, in light of um, recent insanity coming out of the Kremlin, uh, I would be very happy if we made the year 2027, never mind 2070. And I'm semi-serious about that one. Um, but the issue then is, so somebody says, I'm a nun, I have no religious affiliation, fine, what do you believe? I believe the world will end in fire and flood in five years. Well. Yeah, that's an apocalyptic doctrine that bears many resemblances to religious ideas. So. So. Peter, did you have a comment? Well, I have less to say on the apocalyptic theme and uh, just something about uh, the generational differences here. And it's a very interesting question what you raise. I mean, will young people um, create, in effect, a, um, a religion of climate care um, and, um, I mean, this is impressionistic, but I'll tell you that I, um, last year did a, um, session for Spirit and Place, if any of you all have, uh, been to Indianapolis for that, it's a, an annual festival of arts and ideas that is run out of IUPUI, it's a wonderful thing, and so I did a, um, an event on religion and climate change, and um, it was online. I mean, this was still with the pandemic going on. Um, and just about all the attendees were um, retired people who I think a lot of uh, them were uh, involved in religious communities already. Now, they were very interested in green religion and, and wanted to, uh, elevate this as a theme in their communities, but it still reflected this looming generational divide. I, I think we see in polls uh, that, uh, you know, it's older generations of people who, who are established in these communities and still uh, tend to think communally, uh, you know, partly by virtue of socialization into these communities. And so whether that will be reclaimed by young people and whether they will find their way to a new kind of green piety uh, just because of the crisis that we face, I don't know. But you, you raise a, a, a very interesting question for the future. Shall I um, I think this is an important um, a question to raise, um, but I, I think that it, there's a there's a kind of backstory as well because um, maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago there was some fear of what you might call new age movements and a fear of pantheism, especially among more conservative Catholics and others. Um, and so, but that that the mood of that kind of turn, if you like, um, was slightly different. So there was let there was some radicalism associated with it, but you. But Philip is right that Extinction Rebellion has taken on a slightly different twist. Um, and it's less associated with, um, I think it's less associated with religion, although there are many religions now affiliating with it. But there's a Christian wing of it now as well called Christians in Extinction Rebellion. And one of the people involved in that, I taught in a, in a class in a master's program in London. And she, she was... Um, 
relaying stories and other things about how you know she integrates her Christian belief, which in this case was a Catholic Christian belief, with Extinction Rebellion and, and navigating that sort of boundary. But I think to go back to your question about young people, many of the, some of the people in Extin many of the people in Extinction Rebellion are sort of middle aged; they're not sure. necessarily very young. Sure. So, so I, I think Greta Thunberg is the one that's sort of captivated the imagination of many young people. And certainly from my own experience of, of being a, um, a mother of a, a, a teenager and one in their early 20s, there's another reaction as well among young people. They're aware of the degree of the severity of the crisis, but they say, well, there's nothing much we can do, you know, so they just kind of give up. So there's this temptation towards doing nothing as well as this temptation, or not temptation, but this uh, ability to go into the extremes. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you're left with this very sort of odd, what I'd say among the young people, you're left with quite a, a mix of different reactions um, to it. Um, I think the, um, um, if, you, if you look at the sort of more explicit sort of Roman Catholic approaches to this, which uh, Philip touched on in his book as well with Laudato to see, what you, you, what you see in Pope Francis is a kind of extension of what has happened in the, in the previous uh, papal encyclicals like Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. But now it's taken on a, um, a, a sort of more um, obvious push towards thinking about climate change. And uh, there, has, there have been young people sort of clustered around now in the light of that ladder to see what became originally the global Catholic climate movement, but now has become the ladder to see movement. Or the, uh, and, and then in addition to that, you have integral ecology as well that's becoming more the parlance for policymakers and others. And this idea of an integral ecology, which brings climate, um, potentially religious belief and other issues into the, into the mix of discussion around what's, what's happening in the future. And that's a, a, so it's another approach. So what I'm trying to say is I don't think one size fits all. Um, I think there is a, a huge um, a choreographic sort of mixture of different responses and trying to navigate our way through that as those who are still religious is a, is a difficult and complex one. Um, and certainly even those within these organizations like Extinction Rebellion, you know, have to or are trying to uh, make sense of it all as well. But it's not that Extinction Rebellion isn't a sort of youth movement. It's, as I said, it's, a, it's, it's older, a sort of middle class sort of activists, possibly ones who used to be involved in New Age and other things, and now, now it's taken a different kind of twist. And it is about, um, it, it's not necessarily about biodiversity loss, which is what I thought originally it was, it, but it's more about extinction as such, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of the Earth's system itself kind of disappearing, and along with all the in injustices associated with that. So they're just as likely to be concerned about um, Black Lives Matter as um, ecology in Extinction Rebellion. There's this combination of uh, thinking about injustice more broadly with climate extinctions. And just a real final um, footnote on that. Uh, we can talk about this at great length, but you can certainly uh, argue for a strong climate uh, dimension in uh, Putin's policies in uh, Ukraine and what he's trying to do and how he imagines the, uh, uh, the future. It's often a problem trying to see sanity in the midst of insanity, uh, but, but you can argue for a climate uh, future dimension in that. Okay. So I have a very similar question. Oh, okay. um, phrased slightly differently, but I was thinking about um, how you know, I used to many, a long time ago, I taught a course that I called From Howling Wilderness to Mother Earth, um, and this will date when I taught this, but I um, used examples like Earth First, Dave Foreman, Julia Butterfly Hill, um, and what was so striking was that these environmental activists all came from evangelical Protestant backgrounds. There was another guy called the Mad Vegetarian Cowboy is how he built himself, um, and they, you know, extracted the, the Christian element, but very much recreated precisely the same structures. Uh, so I think that it, there's a closer connection even than, okay, here is something that looks, looks like religion. But so I was 
I was thinking you could, after you're done with Empire, you could restructure your title for a new book, which I think could be Faith, Climate, and Catastrophe, How Changes in Religion Have Shaped Responses to Climate Upheaval. <laughs> and looking at the way the different structures and different societies are actually shaping responses. You know, many uh, years ago, um, I wrote a book called uh, uh, Dream Catchers, which was about uh, changing white American responses to Native American uh, religion. Uh, and my unofficial subtitle um, w was the transition from they're all worshiping the devil to let's go build a sweat lodge. Um, uh, and I'm sure uh, the, the two trajectories would have been very parallel. about the pandemic, um, assuming that you wrote the majority of this book during pandemic conditions. Um, I'm not sure that you, you were actually getting the idea from the pandemic. You do write very fast, <laughs> but even for you, that would be super fast, I don't know. Um, but as you observe how people reacted in weird countries to mm -hmm. the pandemic, mm -hmm. did that give you any hope for the future, or like me, were you appalled and deeply concerned at the how the fissures in society were almost immediately activated and the polarization increased? Oh, yeah, um, absolutely, uh, absolutely the latter. Um, and in terms of so many of the features that you get from earlier uh, eras about the uh, uh, the construction of uh, myths, the construction of um, scapegoating. Uh, different sets of uh, warrants given for um, authority um, in terms of myths of, um, of objective uh, science. As you know, the science says this, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, it, it was also interesting uh, for me that, uh, you, you know, you, you can produce a very uh, good sense a, a good argument about this pandemic um, and its successes in uh, uh, in the next decade or two uh, being so closely related to uh, uh, to climate uh, uh, change and uh, transition of uh, diseases from um, animals to uh, uh, human beings, um, and uh, you know the the other thing that was interesting for me. Um, over the last uh, century or so, there's a phenomenon that I've only really become familiar with very recently, but I think it's a very important uh, historical fact, which is how c people in the West believe that climate was something that didn't happen to them. Um, and suddenly they're realizing, uh, uh, yes, it, uh, yes, it does. But also the idea that uh, epidemic, pandemic diseases uh, were things that happened in, quote, the third world. Uh, so uh, in a sense, it's part of the story of the West uh, rejoining the world. If, if I could add just quickly on that, uh, Deborah Cohen um, in an op-ed in the Washington Post makes that very point. Yeah. Uh, it's a really interesting piece, if you can look it up online, um, that... Um, um, no world or no area of the world is uh, in, invulnerable to uh, pandemic or, or climate crisis. Um, so one of the major themes of the book, at least in my reading, was um, kind of human proclivity to perceive um, in climate, in weather, kind of supernatural activity, supernatural influence, supernatural presence. Uh, I just want to maybe ask the, the flip side of that dynamic, um, which is um, where, do we see, where do we see the emergence of those who uh, perceive a divine absence or um, in climate, uh, in climate patterns, or um, um, even um, the God's absence, non-existence, um, you, you mentioned a bit about the rise of climate science, right, as a different kind of explanatory model for, for changes in um, the atmosphere. Um, yeah, what, if someone was to write um, climate catastrophe and the secular, where does that story start? Um, and yeah, how, how does it uh, proceed? I'm, I'm going to pass that one to uh, Peter because that is so much, uh, you know, the, 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 what uh, features as a theme in like uh, Tornado Dodge. Really. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that theme starts in the Enlightenment, uh, and in in the Anglo Enlightenment, it, I mean, it's vivid in a figure like David Hume. Um, his natural history of religion has this line that, when I first read it as an undergraduate, it haunted me then, and it still haunts me. Where he talks about a blind nature impregnated with a great vivifying principle, um, something about pouring forth uh, without maternal care her maimed and abortive children. Ooh. And it, I mean, it's, it, it's, um, I mean, it, it, it's it, very starkly an example of um, a new view of the natural world and um, I mean, w one of the things he mentions in, in that very passage is, is um, the storm, you know, hurricanes, he says, and other tempests, um, and the violence of nature. Um, and so um, people today tend to focus on the new atheists and a, a, a new brand of skepticism, but I, I think it, it's, it, it certainly goes back as far as the 18th century um, and um, to some extent the 17th century as well. You know, the, the, there's one literary uh, monument I would cite, it's in a later uh, era, but there's a very interesting Tennyson poem from the 1880s, a couple of years after uh, Krakatoa. And I, I think this is really a sort of absolute literary breakthrough. And what he says is this, and uh, the poem is called Telemachus. And it tells the story of a Christian monk in the, I don't know, fifth century, uh, who goes off to march into the arena and try and stop the gladiatorial games because he's had a vision from God and he is martyred. Okay, and it's a famous, authentic story. But Tennyson starts it by saying, well, let's imagine there's been this huge volcano off halfway around the world. There's um, uh, uh, all this um, ruin in the sky and we're getting these amazing red sunsets. And that's what drives this man to have what he thinks is a religious vision. And it's an absolutely materialistic sense, uh, foundation for a, um, a, a religious uh, act. So uh, but, but that's, uh, that's classic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's also interesting when, when later people who know all the scientific stuff still revert to the mythological framework. And it's like one of the great uh, uh, works of, I suppose, understanding climate in fiction. There's a 1950s book by George uh, Stewart called The Storm which describes a massive storm hitting the United States, but is told in the form of a biography of the storm as a climate phenomenon. He recognizes the science, but he, almost every page you can think, you know, he's describing the rise of a god. But, uh, prod a little and you will find religion. Dr. Jenkins, I just want to say thanks so much for um, these comments, and I enjoyed the book. I, I wrote a master's thesis a long time ago on uh, New Englanders' response to the Lisbon earthquake of 1755 oh, yeah. and the Cape Ann earthquake um, in Massachusetts. And so this kind of brought me back into that moment of despair <laughs> and crisis. Um, and I remember as I was doing that work, I, I noticed um, in the research that it was really easy to see just kind of falling off the pages, apocalypse, uh, awakening, need for awakening, um, anti-popery, and kind of anti-Catholicism. Um, and so those sources, of course, were just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking as a non-theologian, as I read your book, um, about the way that climate affects theological knowledge production or mm. reflections. But then as a historian, I'm thinking about the way that sources shape the narratives that we tell about the past. And so I'm, I'm thinking about what happens uh, to this narrative if we see sources in the 18th century, for instance, like um, Benjamin Franklin, uh, as a result of lightning storms, having this uh, social dialogue and the construction of lightning rods to avoid that um, kind of crisis in New England, or Cotton Mather, Benjamin Coleman, um, starting smallpox inoculations, um, dark days that happened in New England uh, where smoke would kind of fill uh, the air, 
um, creating a dialogue about overlogging and that kind of uh, natural protection. So yeah. what happens to this narrative if we look for the voices that are not about apocalypse or crisis or despair and we see the ways that um, crisis, climate crisis could produce positive uh, views of um, stewardship and responsibility? Again, I'm going to turn over to Peter in a moment, because this is very much the theme of uh, things he's, um, he's written. Um, but you know what? One thing I would say about that is, uh, yes, indeed, you can find many things uh, like that. And you can also find them in responses to plague, which is something I've, I've written about more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, recently. But we have to be very careful recognizing what elite minorities uh, think and assume that, well, nobody thought these stupid old ideas after this. And very often, yeah, they did. Um, I, I, and some of those older ideas, whether you're talking about uh, climate and storms or indeed plague and epidemic, really do uh, carry on way longer than you, uh, than you think. I, I, I recently read a book which is about um, Psalm 91, which is a great you know, protection uh, psalm. Um, and the way it keeps coming back, even for people who don't believe it intellectually, but uh, yeah, they're still going to have uh, carry Psalm 91 to protect them. And the uh, the last soldier, whose um, whose mom will send him a copy of uh, Psalm 91 to protect him uh, from death in war, has not yet been born. Mm. Sorry. Well, I I would certainly second what Philip has just said about uh, the uh, fact that you can find simultaneously th these um, uh, Franklin Mather type figures uh, and um, examples of an older kind of attitude. Um, I mean, the, the vivid instance of that, which I'm sure you know, is uh, that when Cotton Mather advocated inoculation, um, one Bostonian was so incensed that he lobbed a, a primitive grenade into Mather's house with a note attached. It didn't go off, but the note said, inoculate this, you dog, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, so, um, I, yeah, so what do we make of uh, a... Um, Benjamin Franklin or Cotton Mather. I mean, obviously, they're very different in terms of their religious perspectives. And yet, in, in, on that particular score, they both represent something else that I, I might call a kind of American scientific pragmatism that's emerging. And um, so, you know, maybe that's something that we need to consider, too. Um, is it pragmatism or is it... Um, uh, a kind of um, scientific materialism to go back to the earlier discussion that is is emerging there, and uh, it, it it that's a deeper kind of debate, and and I don't know what to say about that on the fly. By the way, uh, on the uh, on the internet, the the number of people who noted the fact that COVID nineteen could be reversed through 91. Uh, and it sounds ridiculous, but that was very, very widespread uh, in American Christianity and certainly in a great many Asian and African uh, churches. So we don't believe this anymore. Who's we? Celia, did you have a, an inter intervention here on this point? No. Um, well, well, maybe just to say that um, thinking about psychology more than the, the theology. Um, and that's the, the you talked about fast and slow. Well, actually, the fast sort of gut reaction is, is often one that is triggered by certain situations. So in other words, this sort of more slow, deliberative kind of thinking is um, less likely to the, come to the surface in crises. And, I, and I'm just wondering whether this kind of, the more, what you seem to be saying is the more intuitive religious sense is one that is more um, uh, the, the more uh, kind of basic reaction of to stressful situations that is one that's 
that's in, more intolerant. I'm, I'm not necessarily sure I'm convinced of that, but I think it's w certainly a question worth exploring. Um, as, and so I'd, I'd want to actually look at um, using sort of uh, social science research to see whether is that really the case or not, because it may well be the case um, that that happens. Uh, but if that does happen, then we also have reason as well. So we need to be on our on our guard against the t some of those temptations to revert to some of these um, t uh, tendencies to cast blame on others or all the other things. So in other words, I think there may be some psychological factors in here as well as historical ones and religious ones that we perhaps we need to take into account. But to do that psychological research, we take social science and empirical tools which, um, you know, not, I, we'd have to collaborate with others. <laughs> so I'm sort of uh, putting out a pitch for sort of a multidisciplinary approach beyond history, theology, and climate science to maybe include psychology in the mix as well, because I think that could be really interesting. I'm John Reed from Notre Dame, and uh, what an uh, incredibly uh, erudite panel. I feel I could listen to Philip Jenkins talk about Tennyson and science fiction and everything else <laughs> for the rest of the day, but, this is, but I'm, I come back to a kind of primitive question, which is, I understand the main claim of the book to be we can't understand some episodes of religious revival or apocalyptic thinking without understanding climate. That's point one. Point two is you readily acknowledge many instances of religious revival or apocalyptic thinking occur absent climate change. We could go list hundreds of episodes of that type, just as you list episodes of the type where climate seems part of the religious revival. And then point three is, as you again readily acknowledge, that there are moments when the climate changes and we don't see the religious revival. So one is climate leads in some way, drive, shape, affect religious revival. Two is religious revival occurs independent of climate. Three is the climate changes, and damn it, why don't we see a religious revival? What does that tell us about the power of climate as an explanatory okay. factor? That is, I just wonder, will the textbooks of the future really say, will climate be important in, in the textbook of 25 years from now yeah. when it's competing with conventional social explanations, conventional intellectual explanations, cultural explanations. How are we going to weigh this um, okay. as an explanatory factor? It's in unquestionably interesting. I learned a lot from the book. But in the end, is this going to change the textbook explanation? It might in episode one, Edward's revival. OK, maybe, maybe it will, and that's one you highlight. Of course, it won't in two, and of course, it won't in three, because you don't see climate as explanatory there. So I, I just want you to reflect on sure. 25 years from now, what will the textbooks look like, or, or will they look different because of climate as an explanatory factor? OK. Um, very, uh, very important question. Let me um, underline the, the I'm suggesting that the religious consequences of a major climate change or development, positive or negative, are very likely to occur and usually occur. It is not totally predictable, but there is very likely to be a, uh, a consequence there. I can point to a couple where I do not see the sort of great transforming change, and I mentioned the, the mid-15th century one, uh, but I can point to lots of related outcomes in, uh, uh, as a result of that 15th century climate uh, uh, event. Uh, they're not transformative like 1560, but they're there to be noted. And if you try and look at the religious and cultural history of that mid-15th century period without paying attention to that, uh, climate thing, you're missing an important part of the story. Where you are looking at other religious changes of great magnitude, and I mentioned these four, I, I could take a good number of others, and you don't pay attention to the climate element, you really are missing a critical part of the story. 
Um, and uh, by the way, I'm not just talking about climate disasters. I'm talking about larger climate uh, changes. And one thing that I, uh, I write about at some length is the, uh, this warming period in the, um, in the heart of the high Middle Ages, which I would argue provides the essential material basis for many of those key changes in religious thought and life and practice, and not just within, uh, uh, within Christianity. In other words, you have to pay attention to that climate dimension and those material foundations in order to understand the religious uh, developments that grow out of them. The fact that I can point to a couple of exceptions where the change is not as clear as we might think uh, does not invalidate what I would argue is the strongly predictive power of, uh, 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 of this sequence uh, normally. Um, so I would uh, say that if you are writing a history of, for example, the, uh, the Great Awakening, and you're focusing on the years between 1739 and 42, and you're not paying at least some attention to that climate context, um, I think you're making a, um, a serious mistake. Uh, you know, nobody is suggesting that everything results from this, but that it is a very powerful factor in the background that needs to be, um, needs to be made. Um, and that's true of so many of these eras. So the fact that I, I'm saying there are some exceptions does not understate that um, uh, uh, fundamentally predictive power. Things don't always work out as they should, uh, one of the great historical rules, but normally they do. Um, and I, I would argue that if in uh, the early modern period of the ancient world, uh, you do get one of these great climate um, events striking, it is very likely indeed to have far-reaching climate um, consequences, and we have to work to try and figure out why on one or two occasions it doesn't. Thank you. But no, uh, uh, absolutely, very, very important question, one I, I very seriously need to um, address. Did you have to come up here? Do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I, just, I just want to um, sort of think about, go back, going back to my little narrative on deep history, um, because some of the um, changes in the social sphere have been also traced to changes in climate. So, so my question is kind of slightly connected um, with what's just been said, but is, could it be that there's a kind of mediating category? So and I'm, I'm not denying that there is a link, but correlations, as biologists know, um, aren't necessarily causations or deterministic or et cetera. So, so what if it's the social structure that's affected and that then has an effect on, on religion or on religious belief? So just, just start raising that possibility. So, so it's not that there isn't some kind of link there. And the other idea I had was about convergence. So. Um, I don't know if you know um, Simon Conway Morris's um, evolutionary um, analysis, but he looks at different phenotypes around the world and finds a remarkable coincidences of phenotypes happening in same um, external conditions of not of climate, uh, other factors, ecologies, and so on. Um, even if the genetic basis for those particular organisms is, is completely different. So I'm wondering if this is a form of convergence at a big scale um, as well, in, in an analogous way. So in other words, there's converging on certain forms of behavior in these different contexts because of that context uh, pushing it forward in a certain kind of way. So, um, so it doesn't have the deterministic thread of... Um, uh, what you might call social Darwinism, but there is this idea, this alternative idea of convergence that may also be useful in thinking about this as an explanatory framework. Yeah. And, you know, please understand, um, like when I talk about the medieval warm period, I'm not suggesting, uh, you know, the world gets uh, a few degrees uh, uh, warmer, uh, therefore people uh, go out and form new, um, uh, new religious orders. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, there, uh, th th this is a sequence of causation, uh, 
um, and it means, for example, um, larger areas of land to settle, uh, more trade, more prosperity, uh, more money going into towns, more people standing around in towns saying, we must thank God for this, what are we going to do? Um, <laughs> And it also gets to kind of a, uh, an argument that can be controversial, which is how far you talk about the material foundation of religious change and religious thought, yeah. which, which can be, you know, can be controversial for uh, for for people. But no, um, absolutely, the, the convergent evolution one is uh, is a very nice one. Well, uh, Jean, your your comment to to me raises um, an, another fascinating question that I almost. Um, took up in my comments, and then I thought it would open too big a can of worms. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, your point, too, about religious revivals that take place independently of climate, uh, I mean, that raises for me the, the question, um, how do we talk about religion itself as a causal factor in history? Um, and I, if you can't talk about that in some coherent way at Notre Dame, then it seems like you can't talk about it anywhere. And yet, how do we talk about that? Because we're also uh, historians, many of us here who are accustomed to uh, talking about ca causation in naturalistic, you know, materialistic ways. Uh, but I, I wrestled with this a, a, a great deal in the Tornado God book. How do you talk about um, religion as religion, as a driver, um, and that's its own kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one that uh, affects discussions of every, quote, religious, unquote, driven revolution in history. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Right, we're, we're coming up on our two and a half hour mark, uh, it's approaching quickly. So I wanna make sure that those who haven't had a chance to comment uh, have a chance. And uh, at the end, at the very end, I will invite our panelists to offer a, a final word on, on the topic if that's possible. But do we have any anyone waiting to ask a question? Mel, thank you. Maybe on a kind of concluding note, Mel Peel for Valparaiso, concluding note, I'm intrigued by your uh, cover and uh, Noah, and I looked in the index, Noah isn't there, uh -huh. but this is a Gustave Doré uh, painting oh. apparently, and it, it goes back to the earlier conversation about uh, imagining total disasters and then, you know, does hope emerge from that? And I mean, it, it, it strikes me as, it was very uh, uh, evocative to do that, and the, the Genesis 8 to 10, you get this I guess it's a climate disaster. You know, the entire world is flooded, and eight people get away. The end of it is the rainbow, uh, and the promise, the Noahic covenant of never again will, you know, I threaten to destroy the earth. Yahweh says, and so on, and I, somehow, so I, I, I just, um, I guess I'm congratulating you on this, but it, it does, in the grand context that you're doing, it's interesting to raise that as a kind of. Uh, primeval moment of thinking about these kinds of interactions. And somehow I was also thinking about uh, Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos claiming that this planet is doomed, so we've got to start getting eight people off to Mars or something, whatever their idea is. So I don't know if that sets off any echoes, but I, I, yeah. I like the cover. I, I should tell you, I, um, I also like the, uh, the cover and uh, as uh, most of us uh, w uh, will know the actual say we have as authors over a cover is often pretty limited. <laughs> and if we fight hard enough, we can prevent ones that we really hate, but normally we go along with them. And uh, apart from saying, yeah, that looks great, I really had very little say in choosing <laughs> that cover. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I particularly uh, appreciated the, uh, uh, the, uh, the tentacles. And as an old fan of H.P. Lovecraft, I thought this was a, a, a very appropriate cover. But, uh, but I, uh, I, I will pass on your compliments to the designer. <laughs> Any other final questions? I yes. I think we haven't heard a response back to the question, warm or cold? Hmm. Warm or cold, yes. Bringing us back to the, uh, to Peter's. Hmm. 
Yeah, um, and I um, I cannot uh, uh, I cannot answer that. Uh, there is a um, there's a wonderful uh, book, uh, which is a history of Puritans called uh, uh, Hot Protestants. Mm -hmm. um, right. I, I, I absolutely. Uh, I, 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 that, that's not a dating site. I, I hasten to uh, <laughs> emphasize. Um, I, uh, I, I cannot answer that. Uh, but it does raise another uh, uh, interesting issue, which is um, one thing I was very careful to uh, say was uh, the world got warmer in the Middle Ages. Um, and it had all these wonderful consequences in terms of prosperity. Doesn't this mean that global warming is good for us? And th that is an argument which does actually feature in uh, what, what you might call the climate denial uh, lobby. Uh, see, medieval warm, good. What are we worried about? And I, I, I was trying to, uh, trying to avoid that. And uh, in fact, if you do work in this period, that medieval warm period is one of the ones you have to be so careful about for that reason, to avoid giving ammunition to people who will misuse the argument. But on the what, what is best for Protestants, I, I, I note the comments, <laughs> but do not attempt to answer. All right, well, um, may I invite our panelists to offer some final reflections on the conversation or, or other, other directions we should follow, or just, or are we? Well, we <laughs> have a story to tell. Peter? Yeah, just, uh, I'll jump in real quickly to say that uh, what you just said, Philip, reminds me of, um, I think, one of the great things about this book, which is that you, you uh, enter this territory fearlessly knowing full well that in the hyper-politicized debates about climate change, especially in the United States, that a book that talks about a series of climate catastrophes going back many centuries, people could point that or use that and point to it and say, um, look, this has been happening as long as we know uh, uh, climate change is normal. Uh, and 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 yet, I think you do a really effective job of uh, dispelling that and talking about the differences uh, between past change, climate change, and the present anthropogenic situation. Um, and though I'm not a scientist, and I'll have to defer to Celia on that, um, I think you, you do a good job of explaining the science for a lay audience. And so I, I thank you for that. And I have two uh, comments. You, you asked a very good question about, so how did these ideas, uh, how will they show up in the textbooks in, uh, um, in 25 years? Moving away just from the religious uh, angle, I'm, I'm going to bet that as the textbooks are written over the next 25 years, there's going to be much keener attention to some of these uh, climate contexts. So w w whatever you're writing about, particularly in the early modern period or the ancient period, uh, you really have to note some of these climate trends, uh, favorable or, uh, or unfavorable. And if you end up in situations where you're trying to make an argument and the climate science runs against you, then you're going to have to, uh, uh, to deal with that. I just wanted to tell uh, one story, it just harks back to what uh, Celia was saying about indigenous uh, stories. Um, Back in the 1920s, there was one of the most sensational archaeological discoveries that ever occurred in North America, a place called Spyro in uh, Oklahoma. A uh, vast collection of Native American items of astonishingly high quality was found by white treasure hunters who basically smashed their way through destroyed all the murals, destroyed anything that was not of immediate value, and sold everything that wasn't actually nailed down. It's one of the great cultural catastrophes in modern American history. We've rec there was recently a superb exhibit at the Dallas Museum of Art of what is left of Spyro and how far we can, uh, we can reconstruct it. And the quality of the work is breathtaking. But here's the point. It seems to have been collected around about the year 1400 
at the time of, and th th this is not my explanation, this is the Das Museum of Arts interpretive text, at the time of an extreme uh, climate disaster in North uh, America, when people were trying to avert worse happening, and tribal groups and ethnic groups from hundreds of miles around produced their absolute best masterpieces and showcase items and sent them to this central treasure house as an offering to the gods saying, please let this change. But it, uh, it, it gets to the point of how uh, pre-modern, non-Western people understand these climate um, uh, uh, disasters and uh, the different ways in which you can um, understand it through myth, uh, through symbols that we can look at, but we still do not often understand what is being said there. And it just suggests the number of stages that we have to get to to try and come up with any sort of integrated global approach to understanding these human uh, responses from the destructive and the um, scapegoating to the production of magnificent art and um, cultural artistic uh, 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 production. Uh, and just that Spyro story uh, kind of stuck with me as a symbol for this indigenous voices uh, uh, argument. Uh, my final comment um, uh, on all this is, oh, brother, when I uh, get home, I'm going to have to write down and follow up on so much. But I will now hand over to Syria. Yes, um, I don't have much to add, really, um, um, except to say this has been a really, really stimulating conversation. And one of the um, areas in which I've worked um, in evolution and, and theology brings up an important point, which I think is also analogous in this situation, and that is how far are these explanatory tools in some sense undermining um, a sense of um, what you might call special revelation or that, or that uh, divine human interaction, or how far are they explaining it away? So what is it doing to people's own sense of who they are as religious agents when they read things like this? Is it actually encouraging that um, as being true, or is there something else there which somehow explains it away? Now, I'm not saying that this is what happens in the book, but it's, there's a risk of uh, narratives like this and like other sort of evolutionary accounts of religion um, that those who are religious believers could feel threatened by that, and will that then lead them not to take climate sufficiently seriously? Now, I don't know what the consequences are, um, but um, I also think that the distinction between anthropogenic climate change and other forms of climate disruption is something that is very, uh, people in the Western world are very conscious of. And I'm wondering with more education where people in the global south, when they find out, you know, some of the underlying reasons for that and there is if you like an exchange of knowledge knowledge so the knowledge of the indigenous peoples and the knowledge coming from the west is more comes together in more of a kind of uh, we might call circle of exchange whether there might be some uh, trigger off other kinds of violence um, inter population violence is a result yeah. of that and what i was surprised about is that from certainly the account in here there didn't seem to be any uh, groups blaming God for, for climate catastrophes. It was all, you know, it was about blaming somehow directed inwards. In other words, we are sinners. It wasn't sort of, you know, uh, and yet um, in, the, in the Psalms, at least, there's also a sort of outcry of lament against God as well for some of the disasters that have happened. And I wonder what that, the impact of that, what it would have on on our own sense of of, um, uh, of both divine authority, but also on our understanding of who God is. So, but a very stimulating conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me and being part of this. Before we thank our panelists, I just want to um, thank uh, again um, Shana Madonna for organizing 
uh, helping with this, as well as um, Philip, again, for the newsletter, which I know you're all eager to read. And uh, I just want to highlight uh, our featured book review was written by Melissa Coles, who's with us today, um, a review of Powers of Pilgrimage, Religion in a World of Movement. So thank you, Melissa, for doing that. And make sure you always check out the new publications. Ben Wetzel's new book is featured in there, as well as many other ones. So um, it's very exciting. And if you didn't get a flyer, make sure you grab one and mark your calendars for April. Uh, Philip, you've honored us with your, your presence. It's been a privilege to discuss, to read, and then to discuss this book, and indeed been very stimulating, as I think we're all um, rethinking how we how we incorporate these ideas into our own writing. Celia, we're so delighted that, that you could come back to Notre Dame for this event. And um, both of you are, have a standing invitation to the seminar in American religion. Um, Peter, uh, I'm not going to, you know you have a standing invitation and you know that we'll see you, but we don't take you for granted and it's been wonderful to have you up here at the table this time. Uh, and thanks to all of you um, for spending a Saturday morning <laughs> with the Kushma Center. Um, so let's give our, our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you.